Good morning, everyone. Before we start our lesson today, we're going to go to God in prayer. Dear God, our Father, we thank you once more for being such a good and a gracious God to us, for allowing us this one more time to sit at your feet. And we pray now, Master, that our hearts and our minds would be open to what you have to say to us, that we will begin to live out your word in our lives, bringing glory to you in everything we say and do. Now, Master, we pray for our brothers, those that have been affected, infected, and affected by uh, this pandemic which we're going through. We pray your strength in their lives right now. Pray that you would comfort them now, that they would find the healing they need right now in you. And we pray for all our other brothers that are well, that are living their life celebrating you. Pray your strength in their lives right now. Now, Master, we need you to speak to our hearts this morning. So we pray that you would speak loudly and speak clearly, that we would hear what you have to say and begin to operate our lives in what you give us this day. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and thank God. Amen. This morning our lesson is going to come in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. If you remember on last Sunday, we uh, looked at Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Uh, there were three verses that we really want to pull out and we want to stress while we're going through this uh, series of study. Uh, verse 7, 8, and 9. But God gives the command to Joshua. He says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all, to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have, act, may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The thing that God wants uh, Joshua and the nation of Israel to understand that their success is equal to obedience. That if they're going to be successful, they have to be obedient. They mean they have to do what God says. Not only does he give them the charge to do what the law of Moses that he had, he had given to Moses for them to do, but he also wanted him to be obedient to his verbal command because he says while you're going through battle I'm going to give you specific instructions how to handle what you're going through at that moment so he says if you're going to be successful you have to be obedient even in our lives as, as the new covenant believers as those who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be successful in the Christian life we're trying to live, we have to be obedient. Can't get around it. You have to do what God says if you want to be successful. All right. Looking at our lesson now, uh, the, children, the nation of Israel now, has a uh, command of that nation has now been uh, changed from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua takes the lead now. If you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 10 through 18, Joshua takes the lead and he begins to instruct them on how God wants them to go in and take Jericho first. Uh, first thing Joshua do is he sends spies. He sends spies and he tells them to go and check out Jericho before I get there. And uh, 
as they're, uh, these two, he, he, he didn't do like Moses. Moses sent 12 of them, and you know what happened when he sent 12. Ten of them came back with a bad report. And it caused them to wander in the, in the wilderness for 39 years because of their bad report, uh, their failure to obey God. But here Joshua now, he sends two spies into Jericho. And these two spies go in, and they go into whose house? Rahab's house. The harlot. The city prostitute. They goes into the prostitute's house. I don't know what they went there for. Maybe that was the easiest house to get to. But they went into Rahab's house. And, and, and they go in. And Rahab, when she sees them, she knows exactly who they are. She said, I know why y'all here. And I know y'all coming to take our city. But if, when y'all do come, find a little mercy and have it on me. They say, okay, Rahab, but she, she, now, now, not only did Rahab see him coming in the city, but the officials of the city saw him coming in too. So they sent they send some guys over to Rahab's house and say, hey, where are those two guys that showed up over here? She said, uh, they was here, but they gone now. Rahab actually lies. She said, they done left. If you hurry... You can catch them. You can overtake them. So, so they run out and leave. When they're gone, Rahab goes to where she's hidden these two men. And she says to them, she says, look, I know y'all coming and I know y'all going to take the city. But when y'all do, remember me. They say, okay, Rahab, we make a deal with you. If you hang this scarlet thread out of your window, when we come and we see that scarlet thread hanging out the window, you and whoever's in your house will be spared. But Rahab, you got to make sure they're in the house. And we will spare them. So after that night, she lets them out the window. They go to the mountains and wait there for three days. After three days, they make their way back to Joshua. And tells Joshua to report. He says, oh yeah. Jericho is primed for us to take over. They scared to death of us. All we got to do is go in and take it because they scared. So Joshua's excited now. He said, okay, let's go. Let's get ready. We got to cross the Jordan River, though, to get there. This time of the year, the Jordan River was swollen. It was in the springtime. And in the springtime, because of the, 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 the rain that was falling and the snow melting from the mountains, the Jordan River, which was normally about... Uh, Two, three to ten feet deep in some spots, uh, 100 foot wide. Now, because of the rainy season, season and the snow melting from the mountains, the Jordan River is swollen. It's bigger than it normally is. And here you got some two million folk in across. And the river is bigger than it normally is. Even when it's not out of its bank, it's kind of treacherous to cross. But here now, it's even swollen, and they got to cross it. But you got to remember something. Now, God is leading them. God is guiding them, and God is directing them. So now, when it comes time for them to cross the Jordan River, God gives commands to Joshua. He says, tell the priest, take the Ark of the Covenant. See, I can't do this at home because I'm sitting at my desk at home when I... <laughs> And y'all know how I like to move, so. Uh, yeah, uh, so he, tell, he tells Joshua, he gives Joshua commands. He said, tell the priest to get up the Ark of the Covenant and step in the water. And, and the Bible says when they told, their toes hit the water, the Jordan River dried up. In my mind, you know, when I, before I really studied this, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, God gave them about a two foot, four foot, whatever it took to pe for one or two people to cross. No, 18 miles up river. 18, look, from my house to here is about 13 miles. So five miles past my house is where the Jordan River stopped. The river, uh, San Jacinto River is about where the water stopped. From here to about the San Jacinto River. God stopped the flow of a swollen river. 
you, you, you got to see this. He stopped the flow of a swollen river. A river that's out of his banks. He stops it 18 miles away from them. You think, this, this river's been there for a while now. You think when the bottom of it is kind of muddy, huh? No, when they go to crossing, they cross it on dry land. They, tell, they, give, they give command to the people. They say, you need to stay about 100 yards, or 1,000 yards, 1,000 yards away from the Ark of the Covenant because you've never gone this way before, and the Ark of the Covenant is the one going to lead you to where you need to go. But you need to stay at least 1,000 yards away from the Ark of the Covenant. So he's saying, you need to stay 10 football fields away from the Ark of the Covenant, so you can see the direction God is leading you in. Wow. Yeah, so now they cross the Jordan River. He gives them another command. He tells Joshua, he says, okay, now that you're all are crossing, I need you to pick 12 men out of each tribe, one out of each tribe, have them go back into the center of the Jordan River, pick up a stone, put it on their shoulder, and bring it to the other side. And when they bring it to the other side, I want them to set it down and stack them on top of each other. He said, now the reason I want you to do this, God has given these commands now. He said, Joshua, the reason I want you to do this, I want you to leave a memorial so that when your children come this way, they will see this stone and ask the question, what does this mean? What does it mean? Why are these 12 stones standing here? Well, what a story Joshua and his, his buddies had to tell their children, huh? These 12 stones represent the time when God crossed us over the Jordan River on dry land that we would take the promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now, they're about five miles away from Jericho now. Getting ready to go in and take what God has given. But the key to them having the success that they need is they have to be obedient to God. Now, look what obedience has done for them so far. Obedience has taken them across a swollen river in an unthinkable manner to the other side of the river. But not only have obedience done that, obedience has caused them to put up a memorial to where their children, when they see it, will know what God had done for their parents. And, uh, you know, that's a lesson by itself, ain't it? Do, do, are we leaving a memorial for our children to know what God has done for them? Now, look, if it, during this pandemic, we ought to be leaving a memorial for our children to say, in 10 years, you know, in 2020, when the pandemic was going on, my parents and my grandparents did this, and this is for me to remember oh, that they made it through the pandemic. Prime time for us to start setting up a memorial. You need to grab you a stone from right now. Huh. Remember what I told y'all last week, we're not going to get no land. We're not getting no land. God didn't promise us no land. But he did promise us crowns. And not only can we get crowns, but we can get some of this stuff that's on the wall here. And that we can leave as a memorial 
for our children. Look, our attitude should be a memorial for our children. Look, we ought not to be the ones complaining about wearing one of these. It ought to be a memorial. Brothers, if you would, mute, mute your phones. I'm hearing y'all conversation. This ought to be a memorial. Just listen, when this pandemic is over, I got about five or six of these. I think I'm going to hang them up in my office. As a reminder that God has brought me. And then when my grandson get about 20, he can come in there and say, you know what? Because me and him got one alike. Me and granddad has a, had a mask alike 20 years ago. And it brought us through the pandemic. And then when he has children, he can take that same mask and show his children in 2020, when I was four years old, this mask that I had, my granddad had one just like it, and it crossed us. You got to be living some kind of memorial. Because I'm, I'm starting to think, you know what? This building may not be our memorial. We may never come back here full force again. We don't know. But we ought to be leaving some kind of memorial. There ought to be something, if, even if it's just your attitude. You know what? If you, if, if you can just practice joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, and somebody else can see you practicing it, that's a memorial. All right, let's move on. That wasn't my lesson for today. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, so now they get to, in, in, we get to chapter 5, where our lesson is coming from today. The children of Israel are about five miles outside of Jericho. The people of Jericho basically can see them coming. Two million people. So now the first thing now, if we're going to be successful, since we know that obedience, success equals obedience or obedience equals success, look, the first thing we need to do if we're going to be successful, uh, success for the nation of Israel is dependent on them obediently renewing their commitment to God. Success for the nation of Israel is dependent on them obediently renewing their commitment to God. Verse 1 says, Now it came about, when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. The first thing on our outline says, God has brought terror to the hearts of their enemies with the way the nation of Israel crossed the Jordan River. Listen, they, they've already heard about it. Rahab lets them know. We heard about the things God has done for you when you left Egypt. Now they've just crossed the Jordan River, and they've seen God do miraculous things again for them. So these people in Jericho are scared to death. Oh, Lord Jesus. We don't usually cross the Jordan this time of year. And two million people has come across. And, and, and they done heard about what happened to the, to the kings on the other side of the Jordan River. How Moses and the, and, and the troops of Israel had annihilated and taken their land. So they're thinking in their mind, we know we're going to die now. It's over for us. So they are terrorized by the fact that the nation of Israel is at their doorstep and their God is fighting for them. So since, since, since the the people of Jericho are terrified of them. Look what God calls for them to do. 
B under number one says, God calls for Joshua to lead the nation of Israel in renewing the commitment made to him by Abraham. Look what verse two says. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. It doesn't make sense that they, they, they're at the point now of taking Jericho when all they have to do is go in now and, and seize what God has given them. God tell them, hold on before y'all go. You need to recommit to the relationship that I had with Abraham. He said, it don't, listen, they're getting ready to fight, y'all. But look what God's command is. He says, make for yourselves flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. Huh? What you say, Keith? Huh? They messing with their manhood now, huh? They're getting, ready to, they, they're getting ready to need all the energy and strength they're going to have to be able to muster up and God say, circumcise. <laughs> now, of all times you want, you want me to do this now? Let's go to Genesis uh, 17. Let's look at the commitment that, that uh, Abraham had with God. Genesis 17, verse 9 through 14. God is calling for a commitment for them to renew the commitment that was made by Abraham. Uh, God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old, remember that, shall be circumcised throughout your generation. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God, God calls for a renewal of their commitment to him. He says this symbol of circumcision is a symbol of your commitment to me being your God. And you being my people. He says, you need to renew the commitment. Okay, he said eight days, right? After they were born, right? Eight days. They were to circumcise. That's, that's what he tell Abraham, right? Eight days. So here, here in, in verse 2. He says, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 2, make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. Verse 3, so Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at, at Gilbeth Harala. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. So look what God does. God calls uh, for Joshua to lead the nation of Israel in renewing the commitment 
to him just as Moses was reminded of his wife. Look what verse 3 says. So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gilbert Hera. Uh, so you remember when Moses was getting ready to go down to Egypt, when God had given him the command, go, he had done seen the burning bush, and he's getting ready, and he's going down to Egypt to, 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 to tell Pharaoh, God say, let my people go. And an angel showed up to kill him. And he didn't have a clue why the angel was there to kill him. His wife, Zipporah, pulls out a flint knife and circumcises Moses' son and throws it at the feet of Moses and says, you are a man of blood because you have not kept your commitment to God. Here, here now, uh, a whole new generation of Israelites who were born in the wilderness, whose parents' disobedience causes them not to hold on to the commitment they had made with God. Listen, them not them not trusting God to go in the wilderness was just a seed of the disobedience that was already in them. They had not obeyed God from the time they left Egypt till the time they got to the promised land. Listen, we have to be careful of that because we'll think that only one thing is the reason why, why, why we're not successful. But if we go back and look at our history, it started way back a long time ago, and it's just grown into this level of disobedience we're at now. So here's a whole new generation that was born in the wilderness, and none of their parents circumcised them. No one was obeying God. You, you got to kind of even be a little mad at Moses. Because he didn't even encourage them to keep the covenant, to keep the commitment. The cutting away of the foreskin was a symbol of the Jew being a part of God's family and heir to all his promises. It was a symbol that they were a part of God's chosen people. And they had rights to all of the promises God had promised them. But the new covenant believers, the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, circumcision is of the heart by the spirit from God. Listen, our symbol of our attachment to the family of God is that he has cut away our fleshly nature from our heart. That we don't operate based on our thinking, but we, based, we operate based on his power that lives in us, his spirit that lives in us. I, I, any questions, any comments, y'all stop me if y'all got something to say. Even you guys on the, on the conference call, stop me if you need to ask a question. So Paul says that uh, circumcision is of the heart by the spirit from God. I'll paraphrase that, Romans 2 and 29. He also writes to the Philippians that we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Listen. The sign that you have been circumcised in your heart is that you worship in the spirit. And then we got to understand something now. He didn't say we worship when our favorite song comes on or when your favorite preacher preaches. He said that you worship in the spirit. You remember when Jesus has the conversation with the woman at the well? He, and she said, you know, my people say we go over here and Jesus said, and, and your people say you go in the hills. What do you say? Jesus says, God ain't looking for you to worship him in a place, but he's looking for you to worship him in spirit and in truth. So listen, 
True circumcision is when you worship God in spirit. The spirit of God, that God is guiding and directing your life, that you're being obedient to what God has commanded for your life. And in glory in Christ Jesus. And you ain't trying to say, you see what I did. But you glory in the fact that Jesus Christ has died, was buried, and resurrected to a new life, and has resurrected you to a new life. That's what you glory in. You say, it ain't because of my goodness. It's only because of his grace. Put no confidence in your flesh. I, you know what? I, I, I can't do it on my own. Apart from the spirit of God that lives in me, I am nothing. This mark is, an, is not an external mark. Now, the, 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 the nation of Israel had an external mark to show that they were in the family of God. But now it's a little difficult for us, you know, because we have an internal mark. And you know what, I said it last Sunday. I think this mask ain't just protecting us from being COVID, from, from being contaminated with COVID, but a lot of us are using it like bank robbers. <laughs> yeah, but the purpose of bank robber wears is so you cannot identify him. And I think what's happening with the church of Jesus Christ is that we are pretending to be bank robbers we're wearing the mask and we're going out in public, but we're not acting like our heart has been circumcised. They don't know who I am. They can't, all they know, they can just see my eyes now. And they can't recognize who I am based on my eyes. So instead of us having the character of Jesus Christ with our mask on, we're acting like everybody else in the world. Let's go to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. I, well, I, I didn't think I was going to finish today. I didn't think I was. Colossians 2. Verse 11 through 12. says, and in him you also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised, were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Listen, Paul says to the Colossians, and in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Listen, every day the Spirit of God is living in us. It's trying to cut away our fleshly desires. It, it, it's Cutting away our flesh. That sin nature that we have, the Spirit of God lives in you that you would cut away the sin nature of your life. Listen, you ain't going to be perfect, but you ought to be perfecting. L let me explain what I mean. Because the Spirit of God lives in us, we're not going to do everything right but we ought to be doing some things right. We are, listen, we're not going to obey everything God says every time he says it, but it ought to be a regular routine. It ought to not be an annual thing. <laughs> to where you only obey God around Easter time. Our Christmas time, or your birthday. <laughs> oh, what? What'd you say, Brother Harris? 
uh, on Sundays. But some of us are messed up now. Look, let, let's be honest. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Because some of us, the only time we really did what God called us to do was when we came here. Now you cannot come here. So what you were using to circumcise your flesh can no longer circumcise your flesh. It has to be the spirit of God living in you. Lee Skinner was not that flint knife for your life. He's just your encourager. The Holy Spirit wants to cut some stuff. Out. Listen, let me say this too. The reason God got some of us alone is because he needs you alone. Because he wants to get rid of some stuff in your life. that He just couldn't do it with you mingling with everybody else. <laughs> so he got you by yourself now. You can't do nothing but listen to him. He's trying to take some things out of your life. But he can only take it out if you obey him. Success only comes through obedience. Now the last part of that verse in, in Colossians 2, verse 12 say, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him up from the dead. Listen, we have been raised with him through faith. It ain't nothing you doing that shows that you are have the symbol or the mark that you've been circumcised of the spirit, but it's, it's who you are now. Because it's through faith. It ain't in a suit, shirt and a tie. It's what you believe. And if you believe it, there ought to be signs of circumcision. Let me, let me, let me explain. There ought to be signs of some things you used to do 10 years ago you don't do no more. Let me, let me get a little bit closer. There ought to, be, ought to be some signs of some stuff you did yesterday you don't want to do no more today. Because the Spirit of God lives in us. And the Spirit is cutting away. This lesson was just a reminder that God is calling us to obedience. And if we're going to be successful in building up the kingdom of God, there are some things in our life we need to circumcise. We need to get rid of some stuff in order to build up the kingdom of God. Any questions, any comments? I thought I was going to get further than that today. But I got three more Sundays, so. <laughs> any questions, any comments? Any brothers on, on the uh, conference call line, you have any questions, any comments? No. See, that was you, Tyrone, wasn't it? it sounded like Tyrone. Uh, he, he, either one thing happened, I messed up, or the Holy Spirit did excellent. So we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit did excellent. And we cause some growth in your life this week. Someone say something? Hey, brother. I'm fine. Yeah. Yes, sir. It shows that God is, is serious about obedience. He's serious about obedience, about us. 
This is what Brother Max said. Brother Max said it, it is something that God allowed the old generation to all die in the wilderness and raise up a new generation to go into the promised land. It is amazing that God would do such a thing. But God is just showing us he's serious about obedience, about us living life through him. Any other questions, any other comments? All right, let's go to God in prayer, and we're going to close for the day. Gracious Master, we thank you once more. Because we believe it was you that spoke your word in this place this day. And we believe that because your spirit lives in us, you're going to empower us to carry this out in our lives. So, Master, we look forward with anticipation what you're going to do in and through us as a result of us spending this time with you this day. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and thank God.